So good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I'm really delighted to welcome so many of you here today. And this is to unpack the lessons that we've learned from the first implementation study of a COVID-19 vaccine in our country. I'm so delighted to see that so many have registered. Actually, we had over 400 that responded. And this included re researchers, regulators, civil society, and people from the public at large. And this is testament to the importance of today's activity. So this webinar is an activity of the South African Medical Research Council's bioethics advisory panel. And this panel was established just about a year ago. Uh, and it's been established through the office of the president and CEO, uh, Professor Glenda Gray. And the aim of the panel is that of enhancing ethical and human rights direction in all the undertakings of the MRC. Uh, the panel's functions are guided by the, S, uh, the MRC's values of pioneering, partnering, excellence, respect, integrity, and citizenship. So I'm Ames Dye, chair of the panel, and you will meet some of the other panel members as session co-chairs and, and the deputy chairs, the two deputy chairs who will do the closure at the end of the webinar. You have seen from the program that the objectives of today's webinar are to reflect on the complexities and challenges associated with the Sisonke study, to discuss the strategies drawn upon by researchers, regulators, and research ethics committees when dealing with the challenges, and to consider how lessons learned during the study could assist when planning pandemic research. Now, this pandemic seems relentless, and we don't even know when it's going to end. So questions like, will we need boosters start, have started emerging as well. And if so, do we have enough scientific data for us in South Africa? Or should we rapidly embark on booster studies before the fourth wave? And if we do, then what would be some of the lessons learned in the initial study? Also, remember this isn't the first pandemic and neither is it going to be the last. So pandemic research should be ongoing as part of pandemic preparedness programs. And understanding Sisonke's, uh, uh, both Sisonke's positive encounters and its challenges will assist with research planning and implementation. And this will then respond to scientific, ethical, and regulatory dynamism going forward. We've got a very packed program today. Uh, and just before I hand over to the co-chairs of session one, I have a few housekeeping rules. The first one is all delegates, except for the panelists, are muted throughout the activity. So please write down your questions and comments on the QA facility uh, of, of the Zoom. Uh, any questions or comments on the chats won't be considered because we're concentrating on the QAs itself. I also want to stress that today's webinar is specific to research and will not deal with the vaccine rollout program issues. And there has been much confusion, especially initially, between Sisonke and the vaccine rollout program. Ours is, today's program is specific on research. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Professors Mariana Kruger and Jerome Singh to chair the first session. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to formally introduce them. The link to the Bioethics Advisory Panel website has been included on the program and the concept note, and you will find the bios of all the chairs on that uh, link. Thank you. Over to you, Mariana and Jerome. Thank you very much, Ames. And to the delegates, it gives me great pleasure to introduce three of the most important researchers in our country, especially in relation to HIV AIDS and prevention research. And uh, I'm glad to say that two of them are pediatricians and all three are women. So really well done in South Africa. So the first is Professor Glenda Gray, 
uh, see, currently CEO and President of the South African Medical Research Council, an A1 rated scientist, and I think of importance, one of the 100 most important and influential people in the world. Uh, she'll be followed by Professor Linda Gale Becker, who is a physician scientist and director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center at the Institute of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town. And lastly will be Professor Amina Goga, who is currently the director of the HIV Prevention Research Unit at the South African Medical Research Council, as well as a pediatrician in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health. Now, all three of them have been crucial in making sure that women and children are well cared for during the previous pan uh, epidemic of HIV AIDS, especially the prevention part. And I think they're well suited to particularly tell us about the Sisonke trial of which they were the principal investigators. Uh, we hope to hear a lot more and learn a lot uh, from these lessons so that we are better prepared for in the next pandemic. Over to Glenda. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so um, I'm going to present Plan B, and this is a, a, a name that Linda Gale, myself, and Laura Farrell hatched um, when um, uh, we became aware that um, Plan A or the National Rollout wasn't going to work. So um, I'm going to present um, Plan B, um, and um, and I want to first of all acknowledge uh, the team that um, we worked in Plan B. And you can see these um, were our lead investigators and our key staff and were critical to the success of the program. So I just want to acknowledge, you know, from left, Ian Sana, Linda Gale Becker, Nigel Garrett, Amina, Fatima, Jackie, um, Simba, and, um, and um, our biocare, biocare uh, uh, Leonard, who helped us with the vaccines. So this, this, this team was critical um, for the, the program and worked tirelessly um, for for many for many weeks to oversee this, so I just want to say thank you, thank you um, to all of them for for being part of the journey. And uh, we we could not have done it without anybody um, in this team. Everybody was critical. So um, we had fourteen days um, to hatch Plan B, um, and I'm just going to go through the fourteen days just very quickly uh, and, and explain to you, um, you know, the, the the rapidity in which we had to work. So um, on the 1st of February, which was a Monday, um, data became available that showed that there was limited um, um, VE against the, the beta variant um, with the AstraZeneca vaccines. And these vaccines were making their way across the skies and were due to land in South Africa. Um, at this stage, um, uh, we, we got, we, when we heard the data, we um, um, encouraged the researchers to, to, to notify the minister and um, and um, to to um, to talk to him about these results. Um, during that day, um, um, I also um, um, after discussions with some of my American counterparts, including Larry, I um, contacted um, post office at J and J that day. Um, after um, the president spoke, um, the minister of health convened a meeting, and we um, went through all the um, data and went through all the all the, um, the alternative options. And at that stage, I had mentioned that I had contacted the minister, I mean, I'd contacted the, the uh, contacted J&J &J to ask him for um, uh, access to the um, AD26 vaccines because we knew a few days later that this, this vaccine um, had worked in the ensemble study. We set up the next day a meeting with the Minister of Health and J&J &J to discuss how we could access these vaccines. Um, the next day, J&J &J started to recall all the investigational products across the world to Belgium um, to, to, to start an inventory about how many vaccines we had. Um, by the 4th of February, we knew we had around um, 500,000 doses, and um, we, then just, we, went, we then went about how we could, um, given that there was no emergency use authorization anywhere in the world, J&J um, &J was about, um, had just submitted um, an EUA at, um, at the FDA and um, at this stage, um, even though we knew the vaccine worked, um, um, it was not available uh, for commercial use. And so we had a long discussion to discuss how um, we could um, deliver these vaccines to healthcare workers, um, given the fact that there was no EUA. And at this stage, um, a decision was made that the most optimal way to, to, um, to execute um, this mandate was to do it via phase 3B implementation study, and the MRC was charged with executing this. Um, on the 5th of February, we had a call with SARPRA, 
to discuss um, um, this in an urgent way and the feasibility of being able to do a phase 3b trial. SARPA were incredible. It was a Friday night and um, they took the call and we had a long discussion about, about what to do. Um, on the 5th, 6th and 7th, um, we, we um, assembled um, our protocol team and we started to draft um, the protocol um, and got, got the protocol reviewed um, by um, various international experts uh, as well as J&J &J and the Department of Health. Um, on Monday, the February, um, the protocol was finalized. So a week after knowing um, that we needed a different plan, we had finalized the protocol. We had the budgets drafted um, um, and had um, we, we, we started to um, had submitted our, our, our protocol to, to SAPRA. On Tuesday, um, we, we met with the Department of Health and, um, and um, various investigators to see how we could implement Sasanki and also um, um, urgently met with funders uh, to present the budget um, and also to, to, to discuss how we could ship the vaccines into the country. Um, by Wednesday, SAPRA did a wraparound, a rapid turnaround um, of the regulatory review, sent us comments. Um, we had to redraft the protocol and this in, in, entailed a lot of work from the, the study team we um, also got the HREC comments and we started to, we, res we resubmitted all the uh, submissions to the regulatory authorities. Met with Treasury um, on Thursday the 11th, reviewed the budget, and on Friday the 12th, SAPRA approved um, the, the Sasanki study and our teams met to operationalize Sasanki uh, from that Friday. Um, once we had uh, SAPRA approval to, um, to do Sasanki, we could then uh, bring the vaccines in because remember the, the um, you can't ship the vaccines in um, and, and until you have approval. So basically, on Friday we were able to to start um, uh, making the process of actually bringing the vaccines into the country. Um, these were just uh, some pictures um, of the the processes that we had. This is a, a picture um, of Linda Gall and myself um, of the um, just de depicting the the late nights and the. The, the, the hard work and the exasperation that we were going through at those, those times. Linda Gall always looks much more perkier than me. Um, and just to say that, um, you know, to acknowledge um, these are the kind of meetings we would have every night at eight o'clock at night. And sometimes they would go on to very late um, to, to discuss um, the processes. Um, so um, eventually the, um, um, just, just going back to the Saturday the 13th, you know, we spent a lot of time working with the teams um, had an investigative meeting to plan implementation. Um, on the Monday, the, the, the vaccine, um, uh, um, we were planning the vaccine shipment. On, on, on Tuesday, the, on Monday night, the vaccines were packed um, in Belgium. Uh, Belgium had to get, a, it was a curfew, so they had to get special permission, um, government permission to pack the plane. Um, the plane left on Tuesday um, and arrived at midnight. Um, BioVac um, uh, picked up the, the vaccine and packed all night. Um, so that we could ship the vaccines to the site on Wednesday the 17th um, in the morning um, so that we could uh, uh, vaccinate the president and the minister of health at, at one o'clock. So this just shows you um, um, the kind of work that had to go in. This wasn't an emergency operation and um, it required um, a lot of flexibility both of the regulatory authorities and the ethics committees. And we just want to, at this stage, really commend um, the regulatory authority and the ethics committee for, for being responsive and helping us to hatch the plan so that we could get um, to the um, healthcare workers. We, um, the, 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 the government rollout was supposed to start on, on Monday, uh, the 40, um, on Monday the 15th, and we were able to start only two days later. So we only missed uh, two days and were able to, to um, start vaccinating the healthcare workers um, in, as part of the phase 3B implementation study um, in, in time to make them to, in time for them to be protected um, before the third wave came into the country. So I'm going to stop there. I just wanted to just um, show, share the context of what uh, we were doing um, behind the scenes and the rapidity of, at which we had to work. Um, to try and realize the, the rollout and that it took a, a, a huge team of people and I want to acknowledge them all because each of them were critical to the success of the program. And particularly I want to acknowledge um, Linda Gale um, uh, for being the co-national the co uh, PI and for putting up with me um, for all these last few months. <laughs> Couldn't have been easy.
Thanks. Thanks very much. So I'll share my screen. Um, and just tell me when you can see it. Do you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, thanks very much, everybody. So following on what Linda said, uh, I'm going to present some of the lessons learned and I've divided it into two sections. The one is lessons learned during Sasong Care and implications for large scale implementation science research in South Africa and beyond. And at the end of it, I'll summarize just implications for research. Um, and we're doing this from a PI perspective. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the hard work and also the guidance from Glenda, Linda Gelbecker, and Nigel, uh, my co PIs. So, um, I'm going to go through 10 lessons learned during the song care. And this was really during the actual implementation of the study. And these 10 lessons can be summarized into advocacy, registration, electronic capture system, communication within a vaccination site between staff, health assessments at a vaccination center, guides for vaccine storage, pharmacy staff and vaccinators, transparency about adverse events, real-time support to vaccinees post-vaccination, monitoring and investigating breakthrough infections, and then flexibility and teamwork. And so I think the first lesson that we really learned through Sison Care was that we needed to consistently advocate for vaccination. And that was really to reduce public hesitancy and facilitate access to vaccination sites. What we also learned is that we need to expand the vaccination sites to include religious and community centers, schools, shopping malls, and drive through centers. What we found is that there was a lot of concern about severe adverse reactions to vaccination. And the message we needed to get out there was that severe adverse reactions to vaccination are rare. They can be managed, but severe COVID-19 is not easily managed. And so we had to put together very quick, uh, appropriate, clear messaging uh, and peer education using webinars, posters, leaflets, social media engagements and interviews. Uh, and these had to be not just on national uh, outlets, but also local uh, outlets. Um, the second lesson was really around the electronic system because much of the song care was electronic. And so um, it posed a challenge for those people who were not digitally literate. And so we had to make a concerted effort uh, at the vaccination sites that were staffed by clinical researchers um, to make sure that support was provided to digitally illiterate people um, so that we could help the elderly and marginalized people register for vaccination. At the time of Sasong Care, there was one main uh, portal used for uh, registration. Um, and as we move forward, I think the number of portals for the rollout has increased and that's really, uh, that's been really great. Um, we also realized that at the beginning, um, appointments were encouraged, um, but that resulted, it, without appointments, um, it resulted in, in huge numbers of people turning up for vaccination and large queues. Uh, and that compromised our social distancing plans. And so we had to use a combination of scheduling uh, at some sites, whilst allowing walk-ins on quieter days uh, or when there was less demand for vaccine. Um, and the allowing of walk-ins uh, maximized vaccine uptake. And what we also realized by allowing walk-ins is that there was confusion around the messages that had gone out. And some healthcare workers had not seen the SMSs. Most healthcare workers were used to receiving WhatsApps and we were sending messages through uh, SMSs. Uh, so some healthcare workers had missed the SMSs and other healthcare workers had not refreshed their details. So they had missed the SMS notifications. The third lesson was really around the whole system to capture the data. And I think a key point to make is that it's, it was so critical to have an electronic system to capture data. Um, the electronic system had been built for the vaccine rollout. Um, and that is really the top uh, bar on, the, on this slide. Um, and that is the national electronic vaccine data system. 
But when we changed to a research project, the entire system had to be changed to incorporate the middle layer that you see here, which is the consent process. Um, it took a while to build. Well, when I say a while, everything's relative. As Glenda said, we did this in 14 days. So it took a few days to build the system. So it was the original system, a uh, layered system on top of that to ensure that the consent process could happen. And we verified consent and we had questions to check consent. Um, and then it went back to a system that allowed one to capture the actual vaccination. Um, and so the system really had to be built, had to be tested and watertight. And I think what it demonstrated to us, firstly, is that it is possible in a, in a short space of time. But secondly, um, that it's critical to have an electronic system because in those uh, places and vaccination centers where the electronic system didn't work um, either initially um, or at some points during implementation of the study, um, we had to resort to paper. Um, and uploading paper onto the system posed to be a huge challenge later on. Um, and so what we realized then is that um, an electronic data system is critical, uh, even though this was a huge study um, and was difficult to set up the system or to get all the sites to use the system, it was critical. And the main use came in for scheduling real-time communication with vaccinees, recording the characteristics of vaccinees, ensuring standardization of implementation, ensuring data quality, uh, monitoring and reporting vaccination process progress on a daily basis so we could get feedback every day um, and assisting with the data to measure program effectiveness. Um, it also assisted at busy vaccination centers where the EVDS could be used to schedule uh, participants to avoid overcrowding um, and to make sure that we had adequate number of queue marshals uh, to ensure that during the time of um, large vaccination demand um, that uh, queue marshals were available to make sure that social distancing was maintained as much as possible. Then the other lesson that we learned was around communication among staff, uh, staff at vaccination centers and I think every vaccination, um, not a vaccination center, but every research group with their vaccination center had a WhatsApp group. And this was really important for a couple of things. One is to uh, maintain communication during the day. Secondly, to make sure that uh, there was communication between the pharmacy uh, and people who worked in the queues and on the floor to make sure that the pharmacy was responding and producing the number of vaccines needed by the queue and not over um, drawing up vaccines. Uh, and then thirdly, to make sure that vaccination sites and researchers and uh, staff at vaccination centers get quick, factual and useful information uh, that they need to function during the day. I'm sure you'll hear more about that later. The next lesson we learned is about health assessments at vaccination centers. Um, although severe allergic reactions are rare, uh, we did need to make sure there was a system at every vaccination center for rapid assessment to identify people at risk of severe reactions um, and to identify those who might either need to be vaccinated under medical supervision uh, with pre-medication or who needed to have a longer observation time. Um, sixthly, uh, we had to make sure that the protocol was implemented consistently uh, in a standardized way across all sites. Uh, and so we had to make sure we had guides and SOPs for vaccine storage, for pharmacy staff and for vaccinators. Uh, it was a mammoth task. Uh, we had to have numerous uh, training sessions and all of them had to be done on Zoom. But I think uh, we had really dedicated training teams to make sure that this happened uh, amongst research staff and vaccination site staff. The seventh lesson is really about transparency, about adverse events to the public. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at social media, you'll realize that there is so much um, um, hesitation about vaccination, lots of information about anti there are lots of anti vaxxers uh, and their voices come across really loudly. And so we needed to be transparent about as adverse events to the public. We needed to differentiate between what is a normal reactogenicity that one should expect. So it's not a side effect, it's not an adverse event uh, in the broad sense of the word, it's, a, it's an expected event. And what then is an adverse event? Uh, and how often should we expect adverse events? 
Um, and so we needed to communicate that very carefully, um, frequently and honestly. And what we really needed to do was juxtapose the benefits of vaccination against the risk of vaccination. All too often risks were communicated separately uh, in the media, generating fear and confusion. The eighth lesson that we learned is that when one is uh, implementing a, a study of such a large uh, proportion, um, we needed to make sure we had systems to provide real-time responsive support to vaccinees post-vaccination. That included uh, adverse event reporting systems that are easily accessible, easy to use, and data-free, um, and that were available 24-7. And that uh, people could access not just telephonically, but through web links as well. Um, not just the links were important, but the personal communication and the follow up between the safety team and vaccinees were also quite critical. The ninth lesson was uh, very important, and it was really to develop the system to monitor and investigate all breakthrough infections and deaths. Um, we had a team that needed to be set up. Um, and this team needed to initially uh, investigate, we were investigating almost all breakthrough infections, but when the force of infection was high, we started focusing on the serious infections uh, and the deaths. And we realized that this was critical in order to firstly confirm the occurrence of the event. Uh, we did find that some events could not be confirmed. And secondly, establish temporality to vaccination. Uh, and thirdly, to establish any association with either vaccination or with COVID-19. In many cases, we discovered that um, the person had been vaccinated very recently and had acquired an infection before 28 days. Um, and lastly, flexibility and teamwork are essential, uh, not just within vaccination centers, but in a study such as this, across all levels, um, national, provincial and district governmental levels, between researchers and between public and private sites. Um, I'll now quickly just move on to 10 lessons learned for research. Um, and I think this is just taking it one step backwards to say this was a huge research project. And so what did we learn for, for research per se? And I think for such a large project um, or study, it was to make sure that all communications frame this as a research study. There was some confusion along the line that we had to constantly clarify. Secondly, to make sure that there is central coordination and tracking of all uh, ethics approvals and institutional approvals received. Thirdly, um, if there are many partnerships involved, as with the study, to make sure that there is clarity of roles. Um, fourthly, um, clarity, and I think a few colleagues will speak a bit more about this later, clarity on who needs to provide approval for the study. We know about the regulator, we know about the ethics committees, uh, but who else needs to provide approval? Uh, fifthly, collaborations are possible, and I think we learned that uh, not just through, well, through Sasonke, um, but we also learned that we can draw on strengths, and we have amazing skills and strengths in South Africa across the public and private sector, and people were really willing to come forward with their skills of mathematical modeling and data analysis um, so that we can get, uh, get these data put together to look at vaccine effectiveness. Um, sixthly, uh, when sources, are di sources of data are diverse, just to make sure that um, there's complete access to all data needed for analyses. Um, seventhly, to draw on clinical expertise as needed, uh, we needed to involve uh, several experts in the safety committee as safety data emerged. Eighthly, just to make sure that we participated as the research team in media engagements to clarify the study purpose and the methods. Uh, ninthly, to keep the ch channels of communication open across all research sites to all ethics committees and with the regulator. Um, and lastly, to most importantly, keep participants updated regularly through media releases uh, or little WhatsApp messages that we created that went viral within an hour or two. Um, so I think I will stop there, um, but we're happy to take questions. I'll stop the share, yeah. We'll go over to Linda Gale now, and uh, we are a little bit behind time, so we go directly and then go to questions. Over to you. So Mariana, I won't add anything. I think Glenda and Amina have really covered it all. So thanks very much. I'll, I'll let us continue to questions and answers. 
Uh, thank you very much. What we're now going to do is we're going to, I'm going to hand over to Jerome to introduce the next three speakers, and then we'll take the questions and answers after that. Uh, over to you, uh, Jerome. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I'm going to introduce the next three speakers, and then we're going to have a panel discussion with all of them. Uh, the first speaker I want to introduce is Dr. Rebone Baboa. She is a medical doctor and has extensive experience in clinical trials. She served for more than 10 years as a principal investigator in this role, and she's currently a principal investigator at the Endlovo Care Group. She has quite extensive experience in oversight of several trials and is responsible for the overall conduct of studies in the Endlovo Care Group. Our second speaker that we're going to have is Dr. Erica Lazarus. Dr. Lazarus is also a medical doctor and a joint staff member at Pitts University. She has led multiple clinical trials across various fields and most recently COVID-19. She's currently a project director at the Perinatal HIV Research Unit at the Cliptown Research Center and was the uh, PI for the Sasangwe Paraguana at Ahmed Katra other sites in Joburg. And lastly, and our only male panelist, he's the token male here, is Farid Abdullah. Uh, Farid is, of course, quite well known in the HIV world. And uh, um, in his past lives, he served as the CEO of the South African National AIDS Council and has previously been senior manager in the Western Cape Department of Health. And he currently co chairs the SA National TV Think Tank and is the director of the Office of AIDS and TV Research at the South African Medical Research Council. He also holds a part-time appointment as a public health specialist and HIV clinician at the Steve Biko Academic Hospital. So those are our three next esteemed speakers and I'm happy to hand over to them and maybe we can start off with Dr. Mabor. Thank you, Chen. Um, good afternoon to our national PIs of the Sunga study, our delegates and all protocol observed. And uh, um, we will be discussing the challenges that we had during the Sisonke uh, implementation study. As you all know, just to recap quickly, you had to register or enroll yourself into the EBDS system while you are either at work or at home, or you, can, you could also do that at the site level. You had to receive three SMSs, which one will confirm your registration and the second one will give you a Sisonke consent link where you had to answer about five questions there or six, and you had to agree to, to, to that. And then the third SMS would be uh, your voucher number. If you were scheduled to come to a specific site, then you will receive a fourth SMS with the appointment date. So that was the procedure uh, that you had to unfold it during the registration process. Next slide, please. So, the issues that we had with the voucher system is that the system itself was complex in the beginning. It was difficult for our healthcare workers to use it. And uh, there was no clear understanding as to how it will unfold. And it had different stages where you had to register, as I've mentioned, and get an, another link. So that process of, I have to register and get another SMS and get another one so that I can proceed to the next stage was not clear to most of our healthcare workers where training had to now start to unfold as, as a result. And also the prioritization of, of, of our healthcare workers was also an issue. Um, it was not clear who was uh, a high risk healthcare worker. Some people felt that they were also high risks and, uh, and they were not included according to the way the system was designed. Some healthcare workers would not receive SMSs the SMSs would not come at all, either due to a human error or system error. In some instances, they were delayed. Um, and there were times when um, some healthcare workers would experience, um, you find that they actually work in the primary healthcare clinic. And at that point, the primary healthcare clinic uh, window was not yet open. So they could not register. However, they do work with COVID where they do actually do COVID testing, but they were not um, allowed to register at that stage. So they were excluded and they felt that they needed to be part of the system. The other challenges that we had with the system was that the people who were our administrators, in some instances, you might find that they would have captured a wrong ID number or a wrong name or surname was spelled wrong. 
Um, and in that event then, or a wrong cell number, which was the most critical one as well, we, then you do not receive your voucher number because now it goes to a pers another person that we don't know who. And we didn't know whether that person would have actually used that voucher number to get themselves vaccinated. So that part was also creating a lot of problems and in those issues when we were received by at the site level, respective hospitals, they had to be escalated to the senior protocol team support. The most challenge uh, that we had, is especially in the Bobo province, because it's a rural area, was access to connectivity. The network was very poor. In some hospitals, there was not even an internet access available or if it was there, it was very limited, especially in the deep rural areas of uh, Nimbopo province. And I'm sure even other provinces also experienced the same thing like KZN as well. So the solution that arose from that was that they, in two weeks time into the program, they said, and we need to have super users. We call them Uber uh, users at that point. And only a few people were allowed to be Uber users at that stage. And so that people who wrongly somehow registered themselves wrongly, could, could be Ubered so that they can be in a position to receive prioritized properly so that they can be able to receive the voucher numbers. And that process actually went swiftly uh, over time um, so that people are eligible to get the vaccination uh, as such. The few challenges that arose from, from this, that is that uh, few people did not, those who even had cell phones could not, uh, uh, um, use their cell phones probably uh, because they're techno challenged and uh, some did not even have data who had cell phones. So there was also that issue where healthcare workers could not be able to self-register themselves and hence the delays in the, in the system as well. So the lessons learned is that e-consent is a useful tool to optimize consent processes without compromising GCP expectations but challenges in communities with limited access to online systems and verification systems need to be considered always. And the advantage to that is that it also provided self-control privacy to the participants when they were answering other medical questions uh, pertaining to the registration. Thank you. Great, we'll move on to Dr. Lazarus next. Um, thanks, Jerome, and good afternoon to all delegates. Um, so in order to meet the Sasonke objective, it was important to leave the definition of frontline healthcare worker relatively broad, so that all healthcare workers, even those who did not hold a health science qualification, but were still at high risk of COVID-19 infection, would still be eligible for enrollment. So for example, reception staff, cleaners, and so forth. That being said, there was a need for risk stratification within this eligible population. So just as on a national level, healthcare workers had been identified as most at risk, so too on the ground, we needed to stratify risk within the healthcare population to be able to prioritize the most at risk healthcare workers for vaccination. This was particularly pertinent at the start of the trial when demand was high, as many healthcare workers across various fields were feeling extremely vulnerable and all self-identified as being at greatest risk, regardless of their clinical role. So in order to do this, um, the research site um, staff and the vaccination site staff work together using their on the ground experience in the hospitals and communities um, and identified staff who had direct contact with COVID infected patients as highest risk, especially those who are working in the COVID wards, ICU, emergency departments, and those also at the vaccination sites themselves. The next highest category were the healthcare workers who are working in so-called non-COVID wards. Thirdly, those with indirect or minimal clinical contact, but who are still exposed through other mechanisms, such as healthcare workers in laboratories or hospital security staff who were on the hospital properties, but not in the wards. Um, and then lastly, those who are not in contact with patients or patient-related material, but who were still essential to the healthcare system, um, such as administrative staff. This internal risk stratification led to some conflict initially, um, as all healthcare workers know themselves to be at risk, um, and so they were not happy of being rescheduled for a later date, even if it was just a week or two later. And so we found that having dedicated gatekeepers was very helpful. Um, this both ensured the, that the prioritization decisions were firmly implemented, but it was also a way to confirm eligibility 
just as it would happen in any other clinical trial. So registered volunteers were required to present proof that they met eligibility criteria by showing proof of their healthcare worker status via a staff card or being on a list from a referral facility or having a stamped letter of employment. They had to show valid identification, which also helps us to confirm their age and to link them with that proof um, of healthcare worker status. Um, and then it also linked them to the confirmation of having provided informed consent, which was through the voucher SMS. So we would check that voucher SMS and that it matched their ID and that the ID matched their healthcare worker status. And then we would understand that they were eligible to proceed. If any of those were missing, the gatekeepers would first refer the participants back to get those required materials. Um, and then if they could not produce them, then they we would have to screen fail them as ineligible participants, which as you can imagine was a very unpleasant task, but we did um, have some very definitively um, ineligible people um, trying to get vaccinated. Another challenge that came up um, was a centralized control of risk stratification from the back end that was implemented a few weeks into the trial um, and was um, intended to ensure that most at-risk participants received vouchers for vaccination first. So in other words, those who self-identified during their registration as front-facing and working in high-risk settings such as COVID wards would be prioritized for their in invitation to consent and thus for their voucher to be released. However, this came with its own challenges as many of the highest risk workers did not identify themselves as category one front facing healthcare workers. And this was particularly true of those who did not have a tertiary level qualification, such as the cleaning staff. Also, once this back end system became widely known, it was subject to rigging um, by desperate people trying to cheat the system. So I think that, um, so I think if the, um, if the need for plan B hadn't been so urgent, um, and if we'd had more than two weeks to get it going, then perhaps it would have been possible to include some communication within the registration platform to briefly explain the risk stratification plan, as well as communication within the registration forms risk identification section to more clearly define each category so that people would understand that it wasn't based on, um, on qualification. Um, and so in conclusion, we learned that adhering to basic GCP principles, even in complex large-scale implementation studies is possible, but development of communication strategies and methods to stagger enrollment appropriately will need to be brainstormed for future protocols like this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll move on quickly to uh, Dr. Villa. Uh, good afternoon, Jerome, and uh, thank you. Um, it's an honor to be the token male here. Uh, but more importantly, uh, rather than speak as a member of the research team, I just want to say a few words. Um, as a clinician, um, you know, uh, when, we, when we started going into the COVID wards, and, and I've been a clinician at uh, Steve Beaker Hospital since, since April of last year, um, there was a there was a lot of anxiety and um, nervousness on the part of the doctors, nurses, cleaning staff, as as they have been mentioned. And this morning, I was I spent three hours in the COVID high care ICU, and the whole experience was a completely different experience. Now that that has to do with a few things. One is that you know it's um, the end of the third wave in Gauteng, so. So we, we, we understand a little better how to go about managing this illness, how to use the oxygen supplementation equipment. Um, but I really think that, that a, a critical difference is that all the people in the ward today, the nurses, the doctors, the cleaners, the physiotherapists, the um, x-ray, uh, the radiographers, have all been vaccinated and it just takes the edge of this feeling that you know health workers were being sent into a danger situation into a situation where you know they could become infected and i think there's been a quite a, a big underestimation of the impact that um you know the risk of uh, of of uh, severe disease has had on the health workers 
and and you know many of of the health workers senior doctors at, at steve biko became infected some came very close to losing their lives so there was a lot of anxiety and when i think about my three hours in the ward this morning it was just a completely calm rational normal work um, in a ward with, with 16 patients who are severely ill uh, that's a fundamental difference and i think the vaccination program had a huge role to play in that regard. So just to kind of back that up, let's take a step back, take a, a more of a global view, have a sense of the occasion here. You know, I, I think there's a lot of micro issues about how it was done, how it was implemented, um, and you know, um, how uh, what were the compromises made with regard to the the risk. Um, to the uh, uh, risk of rushing through things like this. Um, and, you know, it's about six months ago. So it's easy, things are evolving so fast these days that six months is a long time ago. But really one has to sense, one has to, to not lose sight of the sense of the occasion. You know, what, how ethical was it to send health workers into COVID wards when there was an effective vaccination available? And, and remember that at that time, AstraZeneca had just been canned. Vaccines which were, you know, on the cusp of being delivered suddenly looked like a distant possibility again. Um, and so when, when Sonke was announced, you know, we saw the, the rush, the, the celebratory mood, health workers of all backgrounds. Uh, I can't help thinking that it was reminiscent, reminiscent of the first elections in 94, people of all backgrounds in queues you know, all there for the same purpose. Uh, I think it helped that there was assurance that the product was SAPRA approved, that it was managed under trial conditions, good clinical practice, and that, you know, uh, amongst the health workers, very aware that 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 um, J and J was effective against the beta variant. Um, so really to, to close my, my, my brief remarks, you know, one has to remember that that the government and the, the system, the establishment, shall we say, uh, owes a duty of care to health workers. This is this this concept of a duty of care is quite fundamental to any employment relationship, any contractual relationship, um, and um, you know the, there's a, a duty of care. Um, that, that government owed to health workers in, the, in both the public and the private sector. And, and I think, uh, you know, Sisonke, the Sisonke trial was, was able to make that, that happen. And it, it means so much on a deep level of the relationship between the health workers in a pandemic and the society for which they, you know, they, 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 they work. So I'll stop there and thank you for, for the few minutes you've given me. Thanks very much. So we're going to have a panel discussion now, and it's my unfortunate task as the uh, as the chair to ask some of the difficult questions now. So I have three questions for the panelists, and I'll give you the three questions at the beginning, and then I'll let you maybe answer it. In, and any one of you are welcome to maybe take an attempt. So here's the three questions, and I'm happy to repeat them again. The scene in the context of the Sasanque trial being a Plan B. Would you describe the Sasanque trial primarily as a host country host trial access initiative? Or would you describe it as a public deployment of a locally established efficacious vaccine in the context of a public health emergency? The second question leads from that and is related. Do you think that participants on the ground understood the nature of an open label phase 3B implementation trial? And more importantly, the difference between an open label implementation trial and public rollout. For example, the participants understand their duties as a research participant versus being a patient. And then lastly, in retrospect, what do you think could have been done differently? For example, with regard to messaging. So I'll start off uh, with any one of you and maybe we can start off with Glenda and we can move on to the other panelists in terms of that. So just to remind you, the first question I had is in the context of Sasangwe, being a plan B, would you describe the Sasanque trial primarily as a host country post trial access initiative or public deployment of a locally established 
efficacious vaccine? Um, uh, probably neither, um, um, Jerome. So um, the week before um, the 1st of February, um, we, we heard that the ensemble study was found to be efficacious. I think it was around the 26th of, Jan of January. So, um, so we knew that, um, the vaccine was effic effective um, in line with the other COVID vaccines. And at that stage, um, J&J had rolling submissions um, at, at SAPRA and um, in, at the FDA and other, EU and, and other agencies. And so there was no emergency use, use authorization at that stage. And so, um, at, you know, um, so there was no commercial lot of vaccine available. And so the only, the only lots that were available were investigational product. So there was no commercial lot, any investigational product, um, um, which, um, and, and given the fact that there was no um, approvals, there was no section 21 or EUA in South Africa, it, it um, had to be, um, in terms of regulatory requirements, it had to be a, um, a phase 3B study. Um, um, and um, it was open label because it was non-randomized. Did the, did the public understand that? I think, um, we, we did try and um, we, we, we tried to clarify it a lot, you know, so we, there was a lot of media attention, a lot of attention at Parliament, um, the, the MRC, the, you know, we, 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 um, uh, we tried to um, explain to the public, I went on many platforms to explain as did others. So, I mean, I think um, we tried to explain what a phase 3B implement, implementation study was. Um, and um, it was not part of a, uh, it wasn't part of the rollout. There was confusion. We, we did try to clarify it. Um, I guess it's, you know, I think it's a half a million doses. And, um, and um, uh, you know, I guess the, um, the kind of the technical aspects of it being a phase 3B trial uh, could have been a loss to the general public who may not have been um, clinical trial research literate. But I think we did try and explain it. Um, on many platforms, both the minister, parliament, um, and the other investigators. Plus, we did send out um, um, media, um, you know, information on that uh, to try and explain the, the difference. And um, maybe to, um, and then at a local level, um, the um, investigators at a at a vaccine site. Um, we we always had investigators and research site staff there, who who would do um, information sessions. So um, I think that the, the team did their best uh, to, to clarify, um, you know, what the trial was. And I guess that, um, one, one can always be open to criticism um, and, and saying that uh, maybe um, we could have done a better job with explaining it. And, you know, maybe that is possible as well. So I don't know if I, Linda Gale, if you want to say anything um, 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 or Amina about, um, about about it, so I, I would just say that I, um, I in Jerome, I don't think it was it's either of those things. It was a it was a uh, implementation study, um, a phase three B because it hadn't been registered. We used investigational product, and so it wasn't um, post trial access or anything like that. Or um, um, uh, so anyway, LGB, I don't if you want to say anything. Uh, and so, Eric has also put her, her face on. Linda, I would just add that in keeping with an open label study, individuals were instructed that they had to um, use the electronic informed consent and that was not possible. So we did create, albeit very quickly and in a very rushed way, we did create that extra step which did mean, first of all, to follow GCP. I saw some other questions around there that, you know, it was important people um, were, were aware that they were volunteering um, and could opt not to participate um, if they wished, um, and that they were therefore uh, entering into a study. So I think that also added somewhat. Now, in the scale of things, and as Glenda says, obviously there were individuals who said, just tell me what steps I need to do. I, you know, I'll just do these steps. But on our side, we did through all means we could, media, radio, um, at the sites themselves, we tried very hard to tell people it is important that you read the consent 
that you see what you are entering into and that you're very clear about the autonomous nature of this, uh, the voluntary nature of it, and the fact that it is in fact an open label study. So those words were all chosen very carefully and used very carefully. Um, but obviously there, there, there is an element of when you're moving that quickly at that pace, um, uh, patently as Glenda says, uh, that may have not been done perfectly in every instance. I'm almost sure it wasn't done perfectly in every instance, but you know, I, I feel like we did uh, we did try very hard um, to meet the GCP requirements under the circumstances. That's great, and you know, I'm, I'm actually posing these questions because, of course, as you both know, as the co-investigators of this trial, the co-PIs, this has been circulated a lot that this was not well understood. And you know, this is a good opportunity now for you to set the record straight. So that's an excellent answer to the first question. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Erica wants to take a stab at answering the second question. And just to remember what I'd asked here was, do you think participants on the ground understood the nature of an open label phase three implementation trial? And more importantly, the difference between an implementation trial and public rollout. So Erica, over to you. Um, yeah, thanks, Jerem. So I just want to reiterate what um, Glenda and Linda Gale said um, around what we did on the ground. Um, and we made sure that we had informed um, consent discussions with every group of people that were coming through. Um, so every single person that came through got a copy of their consent form just in case they'd forgotten or hadn't read it. And we went through it with them before they went in. Um, we had uh, doctors available to answer questions, but we also had trained um, consent counselors who could go through those things and bring it down to participant level. Um, so, and, and, and explain each of those concepts. So open label, what does that mean? Implementation study, what does that mean? What is the difference between a study versus a rollout? And um, so we really did go through that very carefully. And so, look, I mean, we didn't, uh, you know, we weren't able to have, uh, you know, an assessment of understanding to the degree that we would have had maybe on um, uh, a phase um, two trial or a phase three A trial. But I do believe that people um, did provide informed consent. They did understand what they were getting themselves into. Um, and, um, you know, that it was well explained and people did have an opportunity to have to ask questions and have them answered. Um, so that's just um, an on the ground experience, um, just to um, verify that what um, Glenda and Gale are saying was actually what was happening in real life. Great, very, thank you very much. Um, I think I want to hand over to Mariana who may want to pose some questions to the panel as well. Yeah, I think the informed consent was one of the questions that came up and whether GCP guidelines were followed in this. And I think it's partially answered. And I think, again, you've stressed how difficult it was, but one of the other things posed in the, in the question section is, um, the, are the participants, are you sure that the participants are aware that for the next two years they should inform uh, the study uh, uh, investigators of any adverse events or occurrences? Do you think that they understood that? And it's a kind of question that I think is quite crucial because we are still in a phase 3B study. I don't know who. Yeah, I'll answer, answer that. that. So, so we do this by SMSs. So, in the, so we, we look at early stage safety. Which, and so um, for the early stage safety, um, we reminded uh, participants uh, by SMS and for late stage um, uh, safety, we will also send a, a, an SMS prompt um, and um, um, in, the, in the late stages at one year and then again um, before one month before the end of the study to capture um, late stage um, 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 so safety, but I also need to remind everybody that we do passive and active surveillance. So we don't just rely on um, passive, um, I mean, active reporting from participants. We, we look at all the databases, the death register, uh, the DATCOV um, 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 hospital register, and, um, and other, and, and the NHLS and RCD register. Reg register. And so we, we know um, um, from the EVDS, who are the Sasanki participants, and we're able to match as well. So besides the, the it, uh, depending on participants to report to us, um, we also um, use um, other systems and registers to pick up any other 
um, adverse events that, that may come into uh, hospitalization or death or anything like that. So we do look at both systems to ensure that we pick up because we obviously know reporting will be under, people will under report and that's another. So we have a back end to, to, to look for um, adverse events. We also rely on, you know, um, uh, fortunately, um, uh, vaccine, um, vaccine rollout has been, people are very aware of the side effects. And so very often, all of us, and the girl, myself, Amina, we, we get uh, direct reports um, from participants and then we refer them into our safety desk uh, for, for further evaluation. So as much as we can with the half a million healthcare workers, um, you know, we do this. Um, and we, you know, we, we, um, we know that even if we do send out SMSs, we, we're still likely to be underreported, but, but that's part of um, what's well understood. Um, um, around that, but we do um, often um, get um, um, SMSs, WhatsApps, and emails from people who may be suffering from side effects. Okay, just a one final brief question, perhaps, Glenda, you want to answer that, is just the enrollment uh, in the rural areas. How did it go with this electronic system? Uh, well, we had, I, had over. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, so fortunately, um, we, we worked, um, we, you know, we, we, we developed an infrastructure and the most important thing was to have um, a, a computers to do the um, registration and also to have data. And so we were able to use mo mobile data systems. There was, we, um, in particular in the Eastern Cape, we had a relationship with um, some of the network, the uh, mobile networks who helped, who supported us with data. And um, we also had budgets to, to support the sites with data, but remember we were a lot of this, um, all our, um, all the vaccine rollout sites were, were government appointed rollout sites. And, um, were, and part of their, their process was also to ensure that, that um, uh, connectivity and, and, and computers were available. And where they weren't, um, you know, um, our research sites would support that. So Right to Care, for instance, supported um, uh, um, the infrastructure in the Eastern Cape. Um, that has been rolled over now to the rollout. Thank you very much to the panel members. And again, congratulations to the principal investigators. And I hand over to the next chairs, Dr. Mantua Mokachane and Professor Dani Ratui. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you very much for being part of this program. Um, I'm Mantua Mokachane, as it's already been said. I will not waste more time. I will introduce the first speaker, who is Ms. Fatima Mayet. Ms. Fatima Mayet is a pharmacist for focusing on clinical um, pharmacy. Um, and she's currently the clinical trial unit coordinator for PHRU and, and a NIH wow. clinical trial unit. Um, Fatima, I, it's over to you. Okay. Can you hear me and see my screen, everything? It's all good? Yes, yes, you, yes, we can. Okay. okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for this opportunity. So I'm gonna just delve straight into it. Oh, my screen seems stuck. Okay. So I will, I've been asked to give our experience navigating sort of the regulatory and ethical terrain in a pandemic situation. situation. Okay. I've categorized this as the good, the bad, and the ugly. So everything about Susanke, I think, was unprecedented. I like to call it uh, the crazy beautiful study. What we achieved together was phenomenal. So to remind everyone, um, you know. Sorry, I we think does Fatima need to change her settings? What's on my up? side, there are two slides. Fatima, are you able to do that? Fatima just flipped to present presenters mode at, uh, under display settings. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Oh, I thought it uh, just at the top. Oh, no, I've lost. Sorry, let me just try again. Um, or maybe Patrick, you need to just share it. Just go to display settings at the top there, Fatima. Uh, yeah, the next one, display settings. Oh, I'm not seeing it. Yet. Oh, okay. No, so I don't have that on my side. Sorry. Uh, you, you're Maybe sharing you the wrong share. screen. Just change the screen you're sharing and just select the presentation, not the screen. 
Oh, so Patrick, sorry, I don't have that option on mine, so maybe you can just share it. I'll stop sharing. Yes, uh, maybe Patrick should take over and share, then you can just guide him as yeah, to which and next I can just guide him to next. Okay. Is that fine? Okay, I'll do it now. Thanks. Can you just stop sharing, please? Okay. Sorry, I'm not sure why I don't have a, uh, another mode on mine. No, it's fine. Patrick will do it for you, Fatima. Thanks. Okay, can you see that, Fatima? Yes. Okay, so you can go to the next slide. Great. Okay, so as I said, I've, I've called this good and the bad and the ugly. So to remain, um, to remind everyone, we were asked to provide an emergency solution when AstraZeneca wasn't going to work. And um, we needed to be, and when I say we, I mean the research teams, the protocol teams, ethics committee, SAPRA, we all needed to be, I think, innovative, flexible, nimble, and passionate. And I think we were. Okay, next slide. Okay, so just to give you context, Sisanke was born in February 2021. By this time, and just a year into the pandemic, Janssen had achieved uh, these milestones with <laughs> 26 SARS uh, COVID vaccine. And data from Ensemble One was released, as Glenda mentioned, in <laughs> January 2021. And, um, and at this time, the FDA, the EMA, and WHO, they had or were just about to make, uh, you know, a Janssen was just about to make submissions to them. So um, Susanka was kept conceptualized in the week of the 1st of February, and the first submission was done on the 8th of February, so a week later. Okay, so next slide. Okay. So everything, uh, so everybody was literally thrown in the deep end and um, we had to make things happen for the country. So, and I think there was a lot of good um, that came out of the regulatory and ethics uh, processes. Um, so um, an ability sort of to respond in an accelerated fashion in an emergency situation, I think that we showed we could do. And this was due to almost unprecedented collaboration. So, um, you know, this collaboration happened between the ethics committees, the protocol team, SAPRA. Um, I think everyone is in communication with each other all the time. And the turnaround times were exemplary. Um, so sometimes reviews and comments we would receive in less than 24 hours. And if you, um, you know, look at this table, you can see the first submission was made on the 8th of February. And um, these give you an indication of how many days to the initial approval. Okay, we started on version two of the protocol, but I mean, you can see SAPRA was, you know, went from four days. Um, okay, so that was phenomenal. Next slide. Um, availability. So I think SAPRA uh, com and uh, SAPRA committees in um, you know, the, uh, the ethics chairs as well, they would make themselves available to uh, the protocol team to discuss queries, um, you know, at nights, at weekends, on short notice, and um, this was incredible, okay? Then we had uh, what are called CTF1 deferments. So for anyone who's had to um, complete a SAPRA initial uh, submission, the administrative burden of the documents needed, you will understand. Okay, so CVs, training certificates, site information. SAPRA allowed us to amend the initial ensemble one um, CTF1 to facilitate us to focus on the science of the application. And then documents were submitted and updated in due course, but this process allowed was highly efficient um, for the emergency situation. Okay. 
Then capacity building. I think um, collaborations between the sectors led to upskilling of staff and introduced many new uh, people to GCP and to clinical trials. Um, this is fundamentally driven by the stringent legislative requirements we have in South Africa. Okay, we, um, we had a continual process optimization. So um, COVID and Sisonke, I think it forced SAPRA and the ethics committees to think of new ways to do things and optimize the efficiencies and enhance the clinical trial framework in South Africa. Okay. And then the electronic informed consent, which we've talked about a lot, um, this was a novel approach in many settings. And its approval, um, you know, was, I think, made Sisonke work. And as Erica mentioned, you know, practically we would make sure the sites had paper backups available and people to go through this process as well. Okay. And then um, oversight and reaction, I think committees became nimble and maintained oversight at a time when there were so many new terms and findings. I think they had to make um, quick decisions and weigh up risk benefit ratios and sometimes in a bit of a data free zone. Okay. And then we spoke, I think um, Glenna mentioned briefly our pharmacovigilance. So just to go into more into that, the pharmacovigilance that we established a safety desk a protocol safety review team and a panel of experts to facilitate the support of the safety on the study. So going on to the next slide, I'll just give you, um, okay, the, the Sisonke pharmacovigilance system, um, and I think this answers one of the previous questions, was a combination of sort of a passive surveillance system with an active reporting domain. It was a model uh, for the national rollout to follow, and it was extensive and more thorough than I think maybe usual surveillance systems. Um, a collaborative approach um, between SAPRA and NDOH, I think was adopted and, and it allowed for us to be compliant with the regulatory requirements. And you know, we, we fine tuned the process as we went along. Okay, next slide. Okay, so moving on to the bad, <laughs> okay. Um, duplication. Okay, I think there was a bit of a lack of harmonization between ethics committees, and this resulted in duplication of queries sometimes. Um, our, you know, one ethics committee, for example, sent the exact same questions to us as SAPRA had sent to us. So to, to mitigate, um, you know, delays, we submitted all responses to queries, like from everyone to everyone. Um, you know, phase 3B. So Sisonke was a pragmatic real world study. Much data, I think from phase one to three trials was obviously already available, but the study aimed to evaluate field effectiveness and support scale up strategies. So I think the sub study, you know, evaluated in more detail the immunogenicity, the durability and the neutralization activity of the vaccine regimen. So sometimes we felt this was forgotten by the types of queries we'd get. Okay. Um, as all of you know, there was a prolonged safety pause and that happened in, re um, in relation to uh, clotting and um, investigations into vaccine uh, to fit, vaccine induced um, thrombocytopenia. And this cost us time, um, you know, when we were a country who had no other vaccine options. Okay. And then to vaccinate pregnant women or not. So we added this into a version three amendment. Okay. And then the pause happened at the beginning of April. When the pause was lifted, we were um, directed to remove the vaccination of pregnant and breastfeeding women. Um, and then we were later, a couple of you know, days later, we were told to re add it. So this caused a bit of confusion. And I think, um, you know, this allowance was done. Um, I mean, I think that the steps taken obviously were done in an abundance of caution, but I do think, do think it led to a bit of controversy, um, you know, publicly and around the issue and, and, and the messaging. Okay, next slide. Okay, the ugly. So there were misunderstandings and 
maybe a lack of understanding on how the process was being operationalized. So for example, you know, the interplay between what was a research site and what was a rollout vaccination site. Um, we, uh, you know, study conduct and participant safety was always a primary concern for us. And, you know, all the researchers were very experienced and that's always been tantamount um, from the numerous trials they've conducted successfully previously. Um, and I think on Sisonke. So everyone was watching us. I mean, the world was watching us. And I think for a team that literally committed themselves to working on the study seven days a week, um, we took complaints very seriously and we needed to understand <coughs> act rapidly, you know, to dispel any untruths or misinformation and to try and rectify any inadvertent non-compliance if it existed. Um, complaints were submitted to, to SAPRA and NHREC. Um, these were disappointing as prior to, to that, the sponsors and the investigators were not made aware, um, you know, of concerns to discuss them and to clarify them. There were concerns about whether this was a research study or rollout. And Fatima, uh, can I just yes. make you aware that you're running out of time? Can you wrap yes, up? Yes, I'm almost done. And the research team spent a lot of time clarifying the difference. And this may have been confusing around the info, uh, led to confusion around the informed consent process. Um, additionally, um, this was reiterated at the time of vaccination. We had a complaint that was received by NHREC pertaining to undue pressure applied um, to a regulatory ethics committee. And this may call into question, you know, sort of the capabilities of us to respond um, in the time of emergency. And this is the last, um, you know, one of the other things that came about, um, and I think this also goes to a previous question, was the study also highlighted the lack of clarity as to who had absolute jurisdiction over a research um, conducted in a hospital. So for example, in one hospital, we had three research groups all approved, but um, the research ethics committee that did not have any researchers, they wanted approval. Okay, so what I do think this highlights is that South Africa basically has a robust and ethical regulatory clinical trial framework. Um, and mechanisms do exist for concerns to be addressed. And all stakeholders from experienced researchers to ethics committees and the regulatory bodies, I think, navigated this uncharted territory very well. Um, you know, so I think that basically the study team did take responsibility for everything. Okay, then I've got two more slides. Um, the next slide. So this is just to sort of highlight some of the Fatima, Fatima. phenomena. Yes. We are already over time. Okay, I'm done. I've, I've got a conclusion slide then. This is just okay. a slide to make you see some of the numbers that were relevant. Okay, and then you can show the last slide. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Sorry to, to rush you, but we are already over time. Okay. I'll hand no, over to fine. Prof. Dani Tidoy um, to introduce the next speaker. Thank you very much, Fatima. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Manfwa. I uh, the next speaker is Dr. Boitmelo Sumeti. Um, she is the CEO of Sapra, and uh, yeah, I don't want to. Uh, I think her CV is is on on your screen. And uh, with further any further to do, I would like to hand over to Boitmelo. Hi, Danny. It's not Boitmelo, but Boschia that's come in. Boitmelo has been called to a WMA, uh, sorry, a WHO activity. So Portia and Kambule will actually be presenting on her behalf. Thanks, over. Thanks for that, Ames. Uh, can we agree then that we go to the next speaker? Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon. Um, everyone, I'm sharing my screen. I just want to, to, to check if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Can you just put it in a presentation mode, Porsche? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so what you will do um, in this, uh, it, it, with regards to the report back from SAPRA, with regards to the lessons learned, 
Um, we've also tried to, um, you know, take this opportunity to also talk about, um, you know, the clinical trial application process as being applied by the regulator and also the process and timelines that talks to COVID-19 clinical trial applications and also the guidelines that we have revised and, and, and also touch on the lessons learned. Um, I will briefly and quickly chair um, in the interest of time, just um, show this slide, talk to this slide, just to um, you know, explain the process that has been followed by the regulator when a clinical trial application uh, is been submitted. Um, we do screening, and if the application is not, uh, uh, um, you know, does not meet the requirements, it gets rejected at, uh, or not accepted at screening. And once it meets all the requirements that are, re are, are, are required for a clinical trial application, it will be allocated for review, and then we get the submission of the report, and we have uh, what we call a CTC meeting, clinical trial committee meeting, which is a peer review uh, meeting where that report will be um, will be disqui will be discussed. And um, from, the, from the CTC meeting, there could be different outcomes where the trial can be allocated category 1A, meaning that all, it has met all the requirements um, as needed for a clinical trial application, including the ethics approval, and category 1B, which will mean that um, the clinical trial has been approved from the, from the regulator side. We are just awaiting the um, um, ethics approval. And for category 2A, those will be internal matters that needed to be resolved, um, administrative matters that need to be um, addressed by the applicant, and to be, it will be a response that needed to be reviewed by the original evaluator. And as for the category 3, it means that um, the response that has been received needed to go back to the uh, Dean Cattles Committee meet, meeting for further uh, discussion. And for a 4, we will refer that to a, a specialist opinion. And for category five would be a rejection based on, on, on the scientific information that would have been put before um, the committee. So in short, there are three steps that are you know, in, in, involved in a child sub, uh, uh, um, process, um, which is um, complete submission submitted, and then the review and the outcome. And just to touch a little bit with regards to the process and timelines when it comes to uh, COVID-19 trials, um, you know, in order for us to respond and to a, to, 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 to um, expeditely review the applications. What we have done, we've done is that um, we indicated that these trials um, need to be submitted at any time, not follow the predetermined submission due date as we have always been indicating. And um, we also revised the application form that was done in April, 2022, I'm sorry, 2020, um, just to ensure ex ex uh, you know, the, um, the approval process, process is expedited. And I've also included in this uh, slide um, just the, um, the way the application needs to be submitted to the dedicated email address. And the review timelines, we've um, worked on having this reduced with the first uh, response or recommendation, which is to be expected in seven to 10 days. And in some cases earlier than you know, these days, as we've seen with regards to the Sisonga trial, um, where we managed to approve it within 10, 10 days. And as I've indicated, approval timelines differ per study or queries concerned. And we also um, uh, took a decision to also um, um, prioritize and expedite protocol amendments and TC and additional sites. So this slide here, I'll just quickly go through over it quickly. This is just indicating all the guidelines that we had to amend as the regulator to respond to the pandemic so that um, they, we can do um, a quick um, you know, expedited review of applications without also compromising uh, all the requirements. So when coming to the lessons learned um, as the regulator, um, with, we'd come to um, you know, all the COVID-19 clinical trials, including uh, uh, Sisonke. Um, we've seen that there is um, you know, a, a improved, co improved collaboration between uh, SAPRA and the applicants, and there are you know, lots of joint efforts you know, to expedite the reviews and respond to SAPRA recommendations and queries. And we have also increased frequencies of meetings. And as um, Prof. Uh, uh, Gray has indicated, um, we had meetings day and night, including weekends, and um, we managed to also uh, you know, um, approve the Sisonga trial within four days. What we have also done is that we stipulated tighter time review um, timelines and also response period. 
And um, what we have noted is that with applicants, we have been receiving, you know, uh, responses, you know, typically even before the expected due date, which was a, it is a good plus. It's like all of us are, you know, much concerned, are very much concerned about the pandemic that we're going through. What we also did internally was to get dual review by experts um, in order to expedite this review. And um, what we also send is that with regards to some of the applications or maybe, um, you know, the, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, the capacity of sites when, you know, sites needed to be added, um, you know, they, we would, um, you know, grant what we call um, conditional approval, meaning that as the study is being rolled out, oh, sorry, as the study is being, you know, um, conducted, um, that capacity can be built, you know, ongoing and additional investigators and, and sites could be added. And what we also indicated is that all sites still need to comply to GCP requirements. And what we've also seen is that we've seen improved communication between the investigators and SAPRA and also engagement with the media and the public. And when it comes to the progress reports as part of um, conditions of a, all the clinical trials um, on safety and fertility. With regards to the Sisonke trial, initially we um, indicated a four weekly progress report. And um, with, the, with regards to the, um, the safety concern that was um, you know, reported in April, um, what we had to, to do was to have agent meetings with the applicant and as I've indicated, and also as Fatima has indicated, um, you know, we had meetings even days and even at night, including weekends, to ensure that, you know, all these, you know, safety concerns that have been raised are speedily addressed and also uh, improve the internal collaboration between different various expert committees within SAPRA. And what we also seen, what we have done is that we have also improved collaboration with our international counterparts, and we also participated in the, um, the US FDA engagement with regards to the safety reviews of, of some of the, um, the, report, uh, the reports that would have been received. And um, with, in most cases, what will result in after we have received the, you know, the uh, reviewed the safety um, reports that would have been submitted, the, um, the uh, outcomes would maybe one case would result in us, you know, having to modify the reporting time frame to ensure more regular updates. And then some of the outcomes will also uh, result in the protocols being updated and also the informed consent being updated. And Chair, this is what I've tried to do in the time allocated. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, yeah, I, I think that all of us were quite stretched out for, for time. And, and as I hear you say that you've been working day and night. And I think that was the, the thing that we had with the ethics committees too. But um, Portia, thank you very much for, for that presentation. I'm going to go, give over to, um, uh, to Professor Mark Blockman which is our next speaker. Um, Mark is, is the uh, chair of the uh, ethics committee at, at Grote Skier and uh, is also uh, is also a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine. Mark, thank you very much and over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm just making sure I'm in presenter mode. Are you able to see that? Yes, we can. Thanks, Mark. Brilliant. So uh, thank you for inviting me. And I thought what I would do is... Sorry, Mark. Um, it's in, yeah, it's only... It's in, um, yeah, no, 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 no. Wrong screen. That good? That's yes, good. that's good. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So, um, so thank you very much for inviting me. And I thought what I would do is... Um, is just give a, an overview of some of the issues that we had as, as ethics committees. And then in the chat and the panel, one can ask about uh, informed consent, um, uh, participants uh, being on research ethics committee, ourselves being uh, participants, the issues on stopping the study and pausing the study and breakthrough infections, we can have that discussion. So um, the question is, are we a benefit or burden to research during these times of the, of the pandemic? And just to remind people about what makes uh, research 
uh, ethical and is the 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 different aspects that uh, Emmanuel had put forward and and we have to be true in even in a phase three B pragmatic study to be true to some of these uh, and all of the, uh, the, uh, the the important aspects and principles of making research uh, uh, ethical. So, so some of the challenges is how can studies be conducted ethically in the midst of a, of a global pandemic, recognizing the requirement for rapid review, for rapid sharing of information and making sure that we do due diligence to patients and participant safety. So uh, one of the issues were pausing research and restarting research. Now, this doesn't relate to Sasanke, but it's very important. One of the aspects that we had was that because of the pandemic, we would then be looking to actually uh, stop research. And the balance was between looking after participants with a pr prospect of direct benefit versus stopping studies without. How do we follow up safely participants where uh, for example, patients and their families couldn't come to, uh, into hospitals, uh, issues with uh, follow-up, videos, telephonic, novel ways to be able to contact uh, participants to make sure we're following up properly. And then when to restart, essential versus non-essential, there was a, a big discussion around what is deemed to be essential research and uh, what would that look like? What should the level of PPE look like? And what should the environment look like? We had to take this all into account to make sure not only are participants safe, but researchers are safe as well. And at the bottom, I've put their postgraduate career risk as well. We mustn't forget that we are educational environments that need to have sustainable throughput. So what about the, the, the rapid review? And as most of the uh, people have spoken about in Porsche as reiterated, was that we had to facilitate and the, the, the idea of accelerated clinical trials to try and determine what worked and what didn't work expeditiously and importantly to keep up the evidence base to make sure that it could uh, relate to policy changes. So it required fast review and turnaround, which meant reviewer, which is critical reviewer fatigue, seeing a lot of protocols. Um, we were asking the ethics committee to meet almost weekly, sometimes too weekly to have rapid reviews, but we do rely on external review. And uh, within the time of pandemic, people dealing with their own uh, situations, we were asking people to do a, a whole lot to uh, facilitate these reviews. Importantly is uh, the benefit risk in an unknown disease entity. We were learning ourselves about the, the epidemiology, what was actually going on from a pathological point of view, but being asked, to review protocols within this uh, disease entity and trying to understand risk benefit. And then the leap of faith of using premature data to make a decision around going into, 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 into participants and, and potentially sick participants. And, and what about the, 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 the global uh, master protocol? We were, for example, the solidarity study, there came a, a global master protocol. How do we contextualize it for our, our population? and the actual involvement of the investigators. What is standard of care at the time? What, what, what was standard of care and how do we interpret what standard of care, at, which was a moving target? If there was no standard of care, what about the use of placebo? Placebo became very important uh, to be discussed and we'll talk about it again in, in some of the vaccine issues. And then the adaptive clinical trials. And that required not only SARPRA, but ethics committees to be very flexible in these uh, adaptive studies to be able to take on arms and then drop the arms off uh, and trying to keep the power. So for example, uh, hydroxychloroquine and some of the others which just showed either futility or evidence of harm, which needed to be rapidly uh, stopped those, those arms, follow up of those, of those participants, but to continue the actual, the actual study itself. Uh, what about the vaccine research? A massive push. Uh, to uh, get vaccine research going with limited, very limited phase one uh, data. And, and that is obviously always troubling because one wants to look at the risk benefit. And here you can see while effective treatment for severe COVID-19 would be beneficial, an effective vaccine is needed for there to be any pros prospect of return to normal life. And that's really been the mantra. And, and we as ethics committees had to facilitate, not only the investigators, to facilitate the studies in those. And then placebo controlled or not, it became a, a, move, a moving target. At one stage, there was a window of opportunity for placebo. Then that window closed and it opened again. And so people really had to be flexible and, and thinking on, the, on your feet to protect uh, the participants, but be true 
to um, the principles of, uh, of what the ethics committees are set out, out to do. And, and then how to push back despite this massive pressure, uh, you know, risk benefit versus beneficence versus maleficence, uh, where, uh, where uh, the, the, the public and, and, and everyone's asking for vaccine research, and we may be overly rigorous in terms of our review process. What about informed consent? And I'm sure there'll be discussions in uh, the Sasonka and uh, very vulnerable population, the idea of the therapeutic misconception. It became important, delayed versus divert, deferred versus a waiver of consent within the within this uh, within this within this paradigm. Um, we the idea of using proxies, just, uh, which was very problematic, as family, as you know, weren't allowed onto the platform, and trying to use technology to get hold of family or all only interested in uh, their sick their sick relatives, and yet we're asking them to. Uh, to provide proxy consent so they could be enrolled into, into a study and how to navigate those, those, those aspects, which we hadn't done before. And then safe consent practices, cell phones, video, tablets, how do we uh, provide a safe uh, consent practices for all of us? And what did we learn going forward within the pandemic? How to protect uh, confidentiality, it's a notifiable disease. Um, there was a, a big risk of, of stigma and, and the participants and within the community we at Kuritzke, we had to, we were asked by relatives not to uh, suggest that people had COVID-19 uh, uh, problems in terms of, of either of, of death notices so that they wouldn't be stigmatized in their, in their, in their populations and their communities and a huge risk of, of, uh, of uh, discrimination uh, at, at the early stages. And then the VEX issue on PPE, uh, as, as standard of care as an offering, okay, did we need to insist that all preventative studies supply PPE to their participants? What should this look like? How much, how often, and, and, and who would be uh, funding uh, the PPE? And then obviously the community involvement, especially with preventative studies, who is the community when, when many, for example, healthcare personnel and groups are being assessed and being enrolled? Who is the community representing those, uh, that, that population? Thank you very much, and I hope I kept in time. I look forward to the question and answers. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation, Mark. Um, I think uh, to make up some time, I'm going to give over to to Mantua uh, to introduce um, uh, Mrs. Marzell Haskins from Pharma Ethics. Thanks, Mantua. Um, thank you very much, um, Danny. Uh, Ms. Haskins is a, is, has a law degree um, and she's been in several committees, including Pharma Ethics, as well as NHREC. Um, and she's currently very involved in training research ethics committee members in Southern Africa and is currently in a partner in various EDCTP grants focusing on capacity building of ethics and regulatory um, review in Africa. Thank you. Over to you, Ms. Haskins. Thank you very much um, and good afternoon. So uh, Professor Blockman has, has focused in, in his presentation on the challenges that was faced uh, during the review of the COVID-19 proposals. So um, in an effort for us to not duplicate each other, um, I decided that I would be focusing more on the administrative challenges um, with COVID-19 sufficiency. And this it does, is not limited to the Sisonke study. It is uh, something that we experienced um, with all expedited reviews. Uh, so in this regard, I will look at the challenges during the submission and the review process. So with respect to the submission processes, many ethics committees found it challenging to deal with your paper-based submissions. And this is specifically relevant when doing expedited reviews, when the tracking of studies and assignment of reviewers and report generation need to happen outside the normal time frame of review. So the process of expedited review could really be simplified significantly if ethics could, committees could have access to e-submissions platforms. And that is something um, that I think we as a country and as, a, uh, as researchers and research ethics committees may be something we can move um, towards in the future. Because like Professor Dye said, this is not um, the first pandemic, it will 
probably not be the last pandemic, um, and it would be much better to be prepared uh, for something like this happening and making provision for a system such as e-submission systems that will make it much easier for ethics committees to do expedited reviews. Um, furthermore, we also found that applications for expedited review were often rushed and um, consequently incomplete or inaccurate. So in the effort to hasten submissions, uh, researchers did not, did not always follow the SOPs and the templates of ethics committees, which then resulted in unnecessary que queries and then delayed the approvals. So getting it right the first time actually goes a long way towards expediting the review process. And it's important that researchers realize that if they follow SOPs and they follow templates of the various ethics committees, even though the process is a little bit cumbersome considering that different committees have got different requirements. But it is important to note that if you follow these guidelines, and I'm, I'm sure the same applies to SAPRA, and you actually use the templates provided to you, you will have much less queries and the process will actually go a lot faster. Um, it's also important that uh, the applic uh, applicants provide all the necessary site information to ensure that ethics committees, uh, to ensure the ethics committees that the sites have the capacity to effectively conduct the research. Um, especially when we started looking at vaccine studies, um, you have a lot of sites participating in the research. You're aware of these sites already doing a, a number of other COVID related or other research studies. And it's very important for an ethics committee to be you know, to have the assurance that the site can effectively do the research. So details like uh, the details of the sub-investigators, the principal investigators, dispensers and other supporting staff must be provided to the committees. And um, specific attention must be given to details like GCP certification, dispensing licenses. Uh, we found that often in the rush to get an application through, these small details um, were not given the necessary attention and you would, for example, get applicate um, applications for investigators whose GCP certificates had expired months ago um, or something in that regard. Uh, it's also important that ethics committees know um, when the research will be conducted on hospitalized patients, what the details of the actual hospital would be, as well as the per permission from hospitals to conduct the research uh, where it's applicable. So you often get applications where you apply for a principal investigator within, the in within their site environment, specifically from uh, the private research side. Um, and we know the study will be conducted on hospitalized patients, but we do not get any information from the applicant as to which hospitals will be used, where they will be hospitalized, whether the hospital has actually given permission for this research to be conducted. Okay, so all right now when we go to the administrative part, um, the increased workload on administrative staff also often undermines the optional fun functioning of the administrative staff. Many researchers have limited, uh, research ethics committees have got limited budgets and staff, and they are not equipped to deal with the influx of work accom accompanying pandemic research. And it's, it is the case that many of the ethics committees do work with limited budgets. Um, uh, we find that often they get part-time staff who's not allocated to them all of the time. And all of a sudden, they've got this influx of work that they now expect you to do within a shorter period. And that puts a lot of pressure um, on the research ethics committees. Okay, in terms of the review, um, the challenges that we have with review, it's often challenging to secure reviewers on short, sorry, you can go to the next slide, Patrick. Um, it's often challenging to secure reviewers on short notice and to obtain feedback on expedited basis, which once again puts pressure on the administrators to follow up with reviewers or find alternatives. Furthermore, reviewers are expected to do more reviews than normal and provide feedback faster than usual. The additional pressure on reviewers may result in less than optimal reviews where important details may be missed or where unnecessary questions or queries are being sent to researchers um, that may further delay the process. 
Um, furthermore, administrators and reviewers are often overwhelmed with queries and unreasonable requests from researchers who do not respect the boundaries of the review process. So we've heard about ethics committees and SAPRA working at night, over weekends, um, over time. And I think it's, it's become normal practice for an ethics committee member, for example, or SAPRA member to get WhatsApp six o'clock on a Saturday morning or on, on weird and wonderful times. However, the researchers should try and respect you know, the boundaries. Uh, of the review process. And what is important to remember is that it's part of a committee decision. Um, so contacting one member or one reviewer is not necessarily gonna be able to solve your problem because this is something that needs to be discussed within a group. Um, so these boundaries must be respected. Um, so even though the ethics committees make every effort to expedite the reviews, unrealistic expectations do remain and timelines are often ignored. Furthermore, um, the you logistics... have one minute. You have one minute. Uh, okay, I'm almost done. Uh, the logistics surrounding expedited procedures and meetings remain challenging because it does not fall within the normal operating procedures of the ethics committees and requires constant flexibility on the side of the administrators and the reviewers. And lastly, we found that the review of non-COVID related research is being neglected or postponed because ethics committees and administrators can only do so much with their resources available and without additional staff and reviewers, some applications are bound to fall by the wayside. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much to everyone. Um, I will start by posing the, the first question, just to ask whether every ethics committee in the country was involved or not in, in approval of these studies. If not, which, can, which ethics committees were approached and what was the criteria for approaching those ethics committees? Thank you. I'll answer that question, Mantu. So um, wherever um, our, our investigators of record, wherever they were situated, um, we used their ethics committees. So um, everybody who was an investigator of record who ran a research site and was responsible for the vaccine program had their concomitant um, ethics committee approval. And so, which means that it's, at some hospitals, sometimes three, three different uh, groups uh, would work um, with three different ethics approvals, if you understand what I'm meaning. So let's take, take a, you know, one hospital. Uh, there would be three different teams. So for instance, say I've had used Charlotte, Charlotte McKechnie Hospital, uh, we used Orem and we used um, uh, WITS RHR, which means that uh, Farm Ethics and WITS Ethics Committee would, would, um, would have been approved, would have been approached for that. At Steve Bico, there were three, four different um, research teams working there. There was the, the, the MECRU from SMU that, that were there. Um, there was the um, Setchaba research site. Um, there was, uh, and there was the MRC team, and there was also um, an Orem and the Orem, Orem Pretoria group. So there were four different teams working at one hospital with all their four concomitant um, ethics committees. So um, if there was an investigative record affiliated to a, you know, we all re investigative records had approval to um, to um, had had approval from their their parent ethics committee, for want of a better word. Okay, and um, Glenda, also following that, were they collaborating then or, or, or when they were applying? For instance, the, the four that you mentioned in one space, did they talk together and, and send in one application or was it multiple applications? Well, they all went to their concomitant um, parent ethics committee. So SMU went to, I mean, so MECRU went to SMU, um, the Orem went to, I think it was Farm Ethics or WITS, um, and okay. the MRC uh, team went to MRC, and um, Sechaba went, I think, to WITS Research Ethics Committee. Okay. So um, actually, um, there was one submission sent to each ethics committee with all the relevant sites. For the investigative and, record, yeah. Yeah, and what's important also to begin with is ensemble sites. So these were sites that were initially approved for ensemble uh, one, J and J, and this was like a continuation on that. So okay. that also explains how we chose the sites or decided on the sites. 
Okay. Um, I'll ask the next question as well and then allow um, Danny to, to come in. Danny to come in. Um, Fatima raised an issue about lack of communication between the ethics committees and SAPRA because they were asking the same questions. And maybe I can hear from Portia or, or, or um, Prof um, Blockman on that to see how did they do this? I'm trying to work together if that was a possibility. Well, I think there's always going to be duplication because everyone's going to be asking similar questions. So I don't know if that can, I don't know if it can be helped. I don't, you know, I mean, you don't expect the regulator to talk to the ethics committee. Um, but maybe under normal um, circumstances when we don't have a pandemic, it shouldn't be a problem. But now if we have a pandemic and we keep on asking the same things, Mm -hmm. um, is it not wasting time? That, that, that's the question I'm trying to raise. So I think maybe in a pandemic, we need to think of a centralized ethics committee system. I mean, obviously the regulator cannot change, but um, you know, the ethics committees, maybe we need to consider that option. So, okay. so I'll tell you what we did. So what we did do, the chairs of chairs got together and we developed a group called RESCOP with almost all the ethics representation realizing that uh, the sharing of information would be very, very important. Reciprocal review uh, was, was quite difficult. We didn't, the NHREC had, hadn't been fully uh, commissioned again. So there was a huge amount of sharing. But if you go to your slide, Fatima, you'll see the turnaround times. And it's obvious looking at your turnaround times that there would be, uh, there would be difficult to actually coordinate all of that because everybody's trying to rush to actually turn around and, and give you an answer. And so you will see that there's that maybe some of it was would, would be similar because the opportunity to actually discuss all the protocols with with each other would have been lost in the short rapid review process that we that we had. There is a discussion around having a central body that that will be difficult, but it is being looked at uh, to to consider that. But but I, but I think that. Um, it didn't seem to delay. It may have been a little bit of um, having seen the, uh, the question before, but it wouldn't have delayed because the, the question had been answered already to whichever place you had sent it. So um, I, I think that it, it didn't delay too many things. It may have just irritated a little bit. Okay, all right. Thank you, Danny. Do you want to step in and ask something from the- Yeah, thank you, Mantua. Thank you. Uh, Mantua, now, I, I just wanted to also echo what Mark and Marcel said uh, on the issue with research ethics committees. And, and I think the one thing that will be important for us to look at, and I, I, I know that uh, the NHREC is looking at this at the moment, is to, to uh, streamline the reciprocity process so that, you know, we don't go through all the things time after time that, and, and that we can be able to fast track it. Because at the MRC, we, we, we really um, could make a decision quite quickly because we had, we looked at the, the, the comments that was made by other ethics committees. And so it really did help us a lot to fast track it. But I think the, the issue of reciprocity need to be looked at uh, very urgently, especially in this uh, time of the pandemic. Um, thank you, Danny. There's also another question in, in the Q&A that says, SAPRA has done a tremendous work with its reviews. Is the regulator capacitated to maintain the review momentum for future studies? Um, can a rep, a Portia, will that be you responding to that? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, in the, uh, it has been uh, very challenging as um, also the other uh, presenters you know, from ethics have indicated um, with regards to, to the reviewers. And I, I would just want to commend um, the you know, reviewers, uh, you know, SAPRA reviewers, committee members, and, and, and also the SAPRA staff um, for ensuring or availing themselves, even at short notice, you know, to, to respond to the pandemic as, as is required. Um, what we are doing as SAPRAS um, with regards to um, going forward, including the lessons learned uh, during this, uh, the, the pandemic as, as we, we are currently still in, um, is to work on you know, increasing capacity uh, and also reviewing the processes that we, we have in place for, for clinical trial approvals. So that is something that we're looking into. 
and um, as um, um, Prof, um, Prof uh, Blockman indicated that sometimes it can lead to reviewer fatigue. And this is something that we're taking seriously and into to consideration uh, to ensure that uh, we capacity we, we build in you know capacity and or in, in improve on the capacity that we have so that um, you know we 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 able to um, you know continue doing um, you know expediting the reviews uh, for for what uh, for for the for the pandemic um, COVID nineteen applications. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. There's a comment um, by Richard in, in the Q&A. He's saying, would be interesting to discuss how the ethics committees handled the fact that many or maybe most of their members may have been participants in the study. It's an unusual situation and something we discussed in our committee. Um, any of the ethics committee members, do you want, to, yes, yes, Prof, do you want to talk to that? Yeah, so that um, I think for most of us uh, on an ethics committee, we're the first time that we would be participants in the study as well. And uh, we recognized that up front. And um, what we did was we, uh, in a, one of the ethics committee members uh, who was not going to be vaccinated and was not going to be part of the frontline healthcare personnel, took the onus and the responsibility within the meeting to discuss Sasanke to keep us in line. And that, uh, that, uh, that if we veered off and we ourselves uh, looked at the therapeutic misconception and just said we volunteer to be part of it and we should just pass the study, uh, he would bring us in line. And, 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 and I think that worked very well. But what I noted as chair was, in, in fact, after having that, we actually just lapsed into the usual review process, the rigidity and the regularity and the way we would behave anyhow. So I think a lot of that just fell by the wayside after we've had, we, we had, I can only speak for my own committee, after we had that discussion, but we were very cognizant of the fact that we were participants on that, on that study. Thanks, Mark. Um, Mantua? Yes, carry on, Danny. No, no. I just, I, I just wanted to ask if there's any of the uh, participants um, in this webinar that would like to ask a question to the panelists. Um, but Montway, you can proceed if you want to. Okay, all right. There's a question that says, can the NHREC be the solution in case in cases of pandemic reviews? Was the NHREC in that much involved? Could there be maybe? Ethics Committee, SAPRA, and then the, the NHREC. Um, is there anyone that can respond to the NHREC question? Mantua, from, from the MRC uh, Ethics Committee side, uh, the HREC, um, I think we had minimal um, discussions or interaction with the NHREC as they were not commissioned for quite a lot, a long time. And, and in this time when the pandemic hit us, uh, I think they were non-functional. So we had very little um, interaction interaction from the uh, uh, NHREC at this time. That, that is just a perspective from the SAMRC. Thank you very much, Danny. Um, one other question that I would like to ask, well, maybe um, Danny, you peruse the, the, the Q&A uh, section there. Um, Fatima spoke about um, the confusion when pregnant women or breastfeeding women were removed and then put back again. Can I then maybe ask the researchers, um, Glenda or, or somebody, as to what was happening there? Can you maybe try and explain to us what, what the issues were there? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it came at a time when um, the FDA and, and the CDC uh, paused uh, mm -hmm. because of the rare events that were caught with the thromboembolic events that turned out to be thrombotic throm thrombocytopenia or, or VRT, and um, um, and it was at the stage where we were we were going to um, start mm -hmm. enrolling pregnant women um, and and breastfeeding women, and um, I guess at that stage there was limited safety available, and and so um, we were able to enroll um, pregnant and and breastfeeding women in in our sub study. To, to gather the necessary safety data that was required uh, for um, enrolling pregnant and breastfeeding women. So, um, so, so um, you know, I think there was, there was 
um, at a global level, there were um, recommendations to to um, vaccinate pregnant women, but at that stage, um, there was limited data on the A26, and that's why um, we did we included breastfeeding and pregnant women in the um, uh, in the sub study to 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 gather the necessary um, data that is required by regulators for that group. I mean, obviously, subsequently things have changed, and um, there's a lot more information on 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 pregnant women um, at a global level that can inform decisions. But at that stage, remember, we were dealing with a, a vaccine that was still under EUA at that stage of the of the game, and there were some safety issues, and we had to understand the the um, rare events that were unfolding at a global level. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, I mean, if you want to add anything. Um, if I summarize it correctly, you're the expert on this, not me. No, I think, Linda, you've summarized it. Um, and just to emphasize that we are including now pregnant and breastfeeding women in the sub-study so that we can understand better their adverse events and their immune responses. Um, and I think just noting that particularly pregnant women are at a higher risk of morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. So it is a responsibility for us to offer them vaccination and to also observe and understand the immune responses, which we're doing through the Sasongi sub-study. Okay, um, thank you very much. While we are still there, um, Ames, Thanks. did you want to say yeah. something? Yeah, thank you so much. What I want to ask is what was the ethical impact or what were the ethical issues associated with this halting. I mean, it was halted for quite a few days. We had vials. Uh, what happened to those vials? And uh, should we have a situation like this arising again? What would we do differently, both from the researcher perspective and the regulator's perspective? perspective thank you over yeah i mean I th we did have vials i think we had to we um we i think we lost 4500 vials i think um to me you can just correct me um you know i mean i think that um uh, obviously um halting a study um does impact on um trust um and we did see that healthcare workers post um post the the pause um were were, were hesitant and that's when we ex we we ex extended our, our our definition of healthcare worker to include the health word the healthcare worker definition. I mean the WHO healthcare worker definition. And I see there's some comments um, about um, WHO or United Nations people getting vaccinated. Um, they got vaccinated um, if they fulfilled um, the WHO definition, and we went through that quite carefully. And that's why they were included. Um, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, I think um, when you, uh, uh, the, the regulator and, and the ethics committees, it's their job to optimize safety. And we were in a, we were in a data free zone. Um, and, um, and, you know, obviously, um, the ethics committee and the regulators wanted to see more international data to inform their decision to, um, to, um, and to, and to, and to work with other Regulators. So I would imagine during this two-week period, SAPRA was talking to um, to the FDA, and SAPRA was talking to EMA and um, and to J and J um, to come up with a decision. And um, for obviously, for us in Sasanki, it was frustrating because um, um, we wanted to, you know, we we um, you know we were on a on you know we were. The, the rollout, the implementation of the the rollout of the implementation study was going well, and um, and that and that whole thing, um, you know, did cause a lot of vaccine hesitancy and uncertainty, um, and um, I don't know if, if it could be helped in any way, but I think uh, you know we can understand. Obviously, as researchers, we get frustrated, and um, but you know, if I, if I was an ethics committee or regulator, I probably would have um, done the same thing. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if Prof Blockman wanted to say something. Yeah, so um, I definitely think stopping it was the correct idea. The, the time lag is always difficult to try and get the information that you want that gives comfort to um, the research ethics committees as well as the regulator to, to continue. But I think if we if, if we look at a broader uh, process is that part of this was an implementation and to teach us something about implementation. And so what it did to teach us, it got people together very quickly and it got us to understand this, uh, this adverse event. 
and uh, it got us uh, something in the journal. It got people around the table talking about it. it. What it also led to is making sure that we didn't exclude, because one of the issues were was that we had suddenly just exclude a whole lot of people who, who, who said the word clotting. If you heard the word clotting or warfarin, you excluded them. And by, I think by having these, these conversations, we're able to come very closely not to do that and to narrow it down and to make sure that there was only a small group of people that may be excluded or required more counseling or um, I think Glenda and then put a panel together to have a discussion around them. And so these are all learnings and teachings which we could then take into uh, the actual rollout itself because I mean, there's been other adverse events which, which have occurred. And so we could drop this learning into those other adverse events and how we review them. So I think, yes, it was, it was a slightly prolonged period of time and it may have caused some vaccine hesitancy, but I actually think in the end of the day, it was the appropriate thing, but it gave us some learning and teaching and it brought obviously the regulator ethics and investigators together. So um, on the whole, I think it was a, a good process that uh, came from that. Okay, um, thank you very much. But the other thing then that I want to ask going on from there, do we then allow people with thromboembolic disease to enroll even in the, 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 the major rollout? Are they supposed to be vaccinated or not? Because there's confusion there as well, still. Prof Blockman? Yeah, so if you if you so there's there's actually very few contraindications to uh, to the vaccines, very few, okay. and we should celebrate that. And and in fact, um, uh, that having a thromboembolic phenomenon isn't a isn't a, 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 an exclusion. It it may be that you have to have some more discussion and maybe more intense follow up, but it's not an exclusion. And and I think that was the learnings and 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 the, and the lessons from that. And many of the adverse events are man are absolutely manageable. And as we get a better understanding of them. So, um, no, I'd like to say, no, it isn't. Okay, thank you. Prof Amina, is there anything that you wanted to add? You were nodding quite well. Maybe um, on that point, I think uh, as part of the Songke, we developed uh, some kind of algorithm to guide the research sites um, through assessing participants. Uh, and we tried to make it really simple uh, with color coding to say, you know, if you have a participant with this, well, then do this. Um, and I think that's important. And as Mark says, there are very few contraindications. I think a lot of time people are afraid uh, and they just need reassurance and they need to know which participants need perhaps a bit more uh, rigorous follow up. Um, so that's just in response to that. I think in response to the previous question, just about the ethical issues around the pause. So there were two things around the pregnant and the breastfeeding issue. So pregnant women were, <clears throat> we were about to include them in the protocol. Uh, and then there was the pause, and then we had to remove them. So they were never part of the protocol to start off with. And so there was an expectation from some pregnant women that we would be amending the protocol and that they would soon be able to include to be included in Sasonke. And many were waiting for that. But uh, following the pause, we had to just say, sorry, we're not yet open for a vaccination uh, of pregnant women, except in the sub-study. So we then kept the list of pregnant women who are interested in vaccination. Um, the trouble is that the sub-study is being done uh, not, not in all the research sites, but in specific research sites. So not all those pregnant women could access uh, the J&J vaccine. But I think you know, they very soon went on to the, the national rollout. For breastfeeding women, it was slightly different though, because they had been vaccinated on Sasonke. We then had the pause, we then had to remove them from the protocol. Um, and then within a 24 to 48 hour period, we got ethics approval, or we got approval, not ethics approval, we got regulatory approval to re-include them. But we had already amended the protocol to exclude them and sent that protocol to all the ethics committees. So going back to now re-include them meant another set of submissions to ethics. Uh, and that really caused a lot of confusion. And I think a lot of um, uh, concern and dissatisfaction amongst breastfeeding women who were thought they were eligible for vaccination were primed to come in for vaccination, but then couldn't. Uh, and so I think that just the quick succession of events there and the changes um, just highlighted to us the difficulty with when a situ in a pandemic situation, when things move so quickly uh, and you can't be sending uh, submission documents to the ethics committee every two days. 
Um, and so that we, we did keep a list of breastfeeding women and, you know, we encourage them to be part of the sub study, but that of course is just being done in selected research sites. Um, so I think that perhaps speaks to some of the things that Ames was referring to as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there's a question that Linda is trying to answer in the chat. In the Sisonke study, especially that some of the REC members were participants to the study, what was the opportunity? Was that opportunity also given to the investigators or PIs? If so, why not? If not, why not? And if yes, then was there a chance of some form of interest? Yeah. So anyone who met the yeah, I mean, so anyone who met the definition of a healthcare worker um, uh, was was able to be vaccinated. Um, we had discussed this at the MRC. We had brought um, this as an ethical issue to uh, the group um, about um, research participants and, and researchers. And, um, you know, often, um, you know, so the researchers had done Ensemble One and the researchers were also rolling out um, um, and they were, inter they were front facing um, with health, with, with the vaccination site. So they were at risk of getting, um, of COVID. And so, yes, they fit the definition. And um, we did, in terms of the vaccination sites, we did vaccinate all the all the vaccinators um, mm -hmm. before um, they 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 because you know they they were front facing um, thousands, tens of thousands of healthcare workers, um, okay. in a, and hundreds on a daily basis. And so we know that they were very and particularly vulnerable to um, to to getting um, COVID. And and likewise for the investigators, a record. They were also at the site, and so um, they they um, they were able to be vaccinated. Um, a lot of the 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 healthcare workers, um, a lot of the research staff uh, waited, um, and and um, waited until um, uh, until we had got all the uh, the vaccinators and all the frontline people through the doors, and then um, and then we kind of vaccinated uh in the middle of the vaccination program but yes uh, um all healthcare workers particularly researchers and, and i think we had discussed this a lot about um researchers who um you know had been working i mean they had they had been working during the 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 first and second wave um um doing vaccine trials uh covid vaccine trials so they they really were also um uh vulnerable to to exposure and uh, fit, you know, and deserve to be vaccinated if they chose. Okay, um, I'll go to Nicola's question and then go back to another question. Could you comment on what we have learned as a scientific community about the ability to communicate effectively with the public? Are there ways that we can improve on this, especially in the face of the huge impact of misinformation on social media? Yeah. Um, obviously, healthcare workers, researchers, um, scientists of you know suck at communicating. <laughs> want a better word? Um, and you know we could do a lot better than we do. And you know often we're so busy rolling out stuff um, and busy doing doing the work that we forget um, to communicate communicate better. And it's you know we we do need um, you know we, we need to we need to have people who are supporting us, who are helping us with um, communication and, and that. And so we don't do a good job. And um, I guess, you know, maybe, uh, maybe one of the lessons is like, you know, um, how do we make sure healthcare workers, doctors and scientists are better communicators? And maybe there's some workshops we can run to teach us to be better communicators. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a comment where uh, someone is saying they live in Overport and they were asked to vaccinate on a Friday at 1 p.m. And that's a Muslim Sabbath at clicks in Chatsworth. And he wanted to know who makes these decisions as to allocate people where to be vaccinated. Is this for the rollout or was this for Sasanki? Because we never had a... Um, he, 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 I think maybe then this, this is for the rollout, not mm -hmm. Sasanki. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously we have to be, we have to be mindful that, um, that people have to go to mosque and um, that there are um, times where, where, where it's difficult. And, um, and that I guess if, if you had to go to a mosque and you had to vaccinate, um, you know, I would probably try and do it either before or afterwards and, and not go there at one o'clock. And I'm sure um, 
the site, the vaccination sites are flexible around around that because I think everyone would understand the importance um, of someone um, having to go to mosque and and maybe have the vaccination done earlier or later that day. Okay, there's also a question where someone is saying, is this forum going to address boosters for Sisonge? So I think we're busy. I mean, so just in terms of boosters, um, you know, we've been looking, we've been working with the um, NDOH and with um, J and J to look at the durability um, of the um, of the of the vaccine um, and um, the timing of the boost um, and what you boost with. And so um, it's important to to get data. Um, so a lot of about thirty percent of doctors, I, I, I believe, already have had the Pfizer boost. Um, to the air 26 but we don't have any data on safety mm -hmm. and immunogenicity and you know so we don't we you know it's a data free zone and so we need to um accumulate that data um you know so although you can do it off label um if a government makes a policy like that obviously there has to um they have to work a separate to attribute safety you know because you're working with two now two two uh, vaccines and you have to be able to attribute safety or is it to both? Is it to one? Um, you know, um, um, and 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 also in terms of immunogenicity, you know, um, you know, we know that um, how you sequence and um, how you time your boost is critical, um, and you know, um, and we have to make be careful that we understand, um, you know, that. And so at this moment in time, we are working with um, the government, the NDOH, to look at even fractionating. So we're looking at a a study where we're looking at Pfizer and also looking at fractionated doses of Pfizer, as well as uh, working with um, Adeno Boost and as well as Adeno 5 Boost. So there will be a lot of um, work on that. Um, but if you're a government, you have to also take into account um, the data. You can't just make a policy decision and say everyone must get a, a Pfizer Boost without the data because you, you then get yourself into, um, you know, uh, you, there could be indemnification issues. Um, also, the the um, Pfizer and and J and J have to agree um, that that you can mix and match. And so, even if you do it off label, um, the, there may be objections by Pfizer or or Adeno or J and J to to co use their vaccine. And so, I think that people can do stuff off label, but you can't expect a, a government or a regulatory authority to to um, uh, to authorize that without the necessary data and without talking to the necessary pharmaceutical companies and maybe Porsche and Mark can say something about that, um, about those kind of, the, they, they are, when, when vaccines get registered, they, there's a risk management plan and there's a pharmacovigilance plan and there's also, um, con, you know, issues around their use. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, one has to make sure you adhere to um, the regulatory requirements of the use and that to make sure that the government has adequate ways of, of evaluating um, safety in mix and match matching. Thank you very much, um, Kenda. Um, I would like to give a chance to um, the deputy co-chairs um, to wrap up um, what we've been talking about and what we will probably be doing in the future. I don't know what they're going to talk about. Um, um, I would call upon um, Ms. Kathy Slack as well as Professor Mfuzabengu um, to take over, please. Thanks very much. Um, I'll try and pull out a few key learnings um, in the next five minutes. I probably won't catch them all, and I'm sure the report to follow will be more um, substantive and catch everything, for example, that was in, in the chat. I'm going to use a popular framework to organize this brief summary. It was mentioned earlier by Mark. Um, I'm going to confine my remarks to the Sasonke implementation study only, even though I know that there was sometimes broader, we touched on broader issues of, of the vaccination program and other studies. So in terms of um, scientific validity, I think we heard that learning about um, implementation of vaccination at a facility level or a site level, and not just efficacy at a participant level, um, is really would enhance the social value of, of the study, the Sasanke study, just in terms of social value. Um, in terms of community or stakeholder engagement, we heard the importance of collaboration 
against uh, with multiple stakeholders, including the REC, uh, regulators, investigators, and government partners, especially in this very, very highly compressed time frame. We also heard um, of the importance of messaging Sasonke as a study versus rollout, um, just to enhance understanding of um, concepts like um, open label or phase 3B or an implementation study, just to really enhance understanding of that in the minds of the public and also in those who engage with the public. In terms of fair subject selection or fair participant selection, we heard um, the importance of strong registration systems to ensure that there isn't an inadvertent, inadvertent exclusion of some healthcare workers, for example, those who might have some digital uh, disadvantage. We also heard the importance of strong systems to prevent rigging. Um, in other words, to make sure that most at-risk healthcare workers uh, were prioritized and their interests weren't set back by, for example, chances, I think was the word. We also heard about the importance of engagement of pregnant and breastfeeding um, participants across the study, given some of the twists and turns in terms of their eligibility. In terms of the risk benefit ratio, we heard um, about the importance of strong systems for assessing serious adverse reactions, for reporting adverse events and for monitoring um, breakthrough infections. In terms of informed consent, we heard the importance of participants' understanding of, of key concepts like implementation study, and most importantly, recognizing how to perhaps enhance e-consent forms, um, perhaps to supplement those with additional consent strategies, for example, messaging during the face-to-face -face encounter, and the importance of, we heard some of these additional strategies that were being implemented because e-consent forms are probably here to stay. So it's quite important to think about how to supplement that with additional strategies. And then finally, in terms of regulatory and ethics review, we heard about the importance of SAPRA and RECs um, being able to do and doing these substantive reviews in these really speedy timeframes and the importance of, of amending their processes and their forms to enable to meet those twin goals of both substance and speed, and the importance of electronic review systems for some. We heard about the importance of the availability of SAPRA and RECs in, in an advisory role and not just a gatekeeping role. Um, we also heard that there, it would be important to clarify this issue of institutional REC jurisdiction over a site that perhaps falls geographically close to that institutional REC, but there are no investigators on the study um, that are affiliated to that institution. That's an issue that could be clarified. And then finally, we heard about the importance of trying to refine and strengthen the reciprocal review system and some of the opportunities it might provide us, given that we do have a decentralized review system in South Africa and really need to try and take that forward and strengthen. So thanks very much to the presenters and thanks very much to the attendees for the issues that they raised. And I'm gonna hand over now to Professor Mfutsabengu to make additional remarks and close. Thank you. Um, Prof Mfutsabengu, you, you muted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I just wanted to say that I would like to, to thank Catherine uh, for um, uh, the comments. Uh, uh, Many were similar to me. I just wanted to add some, uh, some of them, few ones. The first one is on regulatory and ethical compliance. I think uh, we have seen that uh, uh, timely and the responsive review is, uh, is possible. And the unnecessary delay is uh, could be also uh, could be overcome by the way the the uh, the SAPRA and the ethics committees work together day and night to make sure that things could uh, uh, could be um, could be reviewed in time the protocols, and therefore it shows that unnecessary delay is not is is not necessary, uh, especially in time of uh, emergency. 
Again, we have seen that uh, there's a need to, uh, to resolve in the future the issue of duplication and uh, to pursue uh, the principle of harmonization and rationalization of a uh, review process, especially in order to avoid duplication. And also the possibility of having uh, a centralized um, a review mechanism um, uh, in, uh, in the case of uh, emergency, because multiple institutional review could be, uh, it depends on the, the chairs, uh, how they work together, but sometimes can be, can, can hinder uh, the process. I think this could be, uh, uh, the other issues which I think I wanted to add was uh, the issue of uh, inclusion and the exclusion of women, pregnant women, I just think that, uh, I think this uh, in the future, phase three uh, studies uh, are already a benchmark, already international benchmark uh, to include women uh, who already have been excluded. Uh, and, and I think we need to be careful that uh, we do not uh, uh, exclude them unfairly, uh, thereby making their access issues uh, more, more, more waste at the point when they need access, and um, and then uh, the issue of um, um, uh, it is a wake up call that uh, again uh, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, so Sisonke is a was uh, for me was a very innovative. Uh, uh, I think this is a way to do to go. Uh, although the uh, presenters did not uh, say that uh, Sisonka was able to kill uh, three birds at one with one stone, I would have said uh, somebody coming from outside South Africa. I would have said Sisonka was very very innovative in the way that it resolved some of of access issues. Uh, uh, in the early times, and at the same time, it was able to uh, to uh, to resolve to come with local um, local evidence on the efficacy of the of the vaccine, which were the local effectiveness uh, assessment of the effectiveness of the vaccine, which was not the same with other countries. And the third, it was uh, so. Uh, the third is. Uh, that it, it, showed, it, it showed how um, a kind of uh, a pilot, a global pilot, how uh, ethics committee researchers, private and public sector could work together to resolve a public health emergency. So it was a scientific endeavor. At the same time, it did resolve the, the, uh, uh, the access issues. Uh, by providing access to 400, over 400,000 people. Uh, when at a time when the access was not uh, guaranteed. Uh, just wanted to say that uh, the E, e of consent is a possibility and we need to explore uh, the viability of the E consent. With these few words, I would like to thank all the participants uh, for attending. It was uh, well attended. At the peak, I would see at least uh, over 276 uh, to even 300. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is not uh, 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 an easy number to achieve in, uh, in Zoom conference. So I think this was very successful. I would like to really to thank all the participants, the presenters, and also the organizer the, uh, 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 of this uh, conference. With these uh, many remarks that are not few, I would like to close the conference and to say I'm looking forward for similar conference and perhaps for the report. Thank you.